You know what bums me out sometimes as we talk about swing states? What bums me out is when it comes to presidential politics, I actually don't have that much of a say as a voter, as, as a voter, just like you are. Why? I live in Texas. Don't get me wrong. I'm still going to vote. I'm still going to run to the polls. But here's the real truth of it. You already know, but presidential elections are about six, seven states. That's it. We, we know. There's no mystery. Doesn't matter how bad the economy gets. We know where California is going to vote this November. We know where Wyoming is going to vote. We know where New York is going to vote. It's all about Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Arizona, North Carolina, Nevada may be in play, Wisconsin. The, these are the states that will decide the next president of the United States of America. And one thing that hits me, and I've been doing political media for almost six years now, but I've been studying politics or at least loving politics for maybe 10 years, maybe 10 years. And it still floors me every single time I watch these presidential results roll in on election night is how close the margins are in these swing states. I mean, you think to yourself, there's all these people, 300 million Americans, the presidential election surely is decided by this or that. Comes down to 3,000 people in Georgia, 10,000 in Pennsylvania. So what's the plan? There has to be a plan. You can't just hope. You can't do what many people have done and failed to do in the past, or I said try to do. What they've tried to do in the past is, well, everyone hates the other guy, so they'll vote for me. Joe Biden sucks, so no one's going to go vote for him. That's not how it works. What is the plan to reach new voters, to motivate your voters to get out to the polls? What is the plan? Well, we're going to discuss that in depth tonight. We have swing state guests. What's going to go on in Pennsylvania? How are we chasing down ballots? Remember what they did in Pennsylvania. Michigan, what are the big issues in Michigan? Is the abortion stuff going to hurt us there? We have a ton to get to tonight. Now, before we get to any of that, there's a new chairman at the RNC. I don't know him. You don't know him. What's this guy about? What's the direction? What is the plan? He's the man who would know the plan. So right now, let's talk to Michael Watley, the new big cheese at the RNC. Okay, Michael, swing states. We're focusing on swing states tonight because sadly my state of Texas is not one of those and I don't really matter. Swing states are what matters in this election. What, what's the big one? And I know we're not being dismissive of any, but if, if the RNC is focused on one above others or two above others, what are they? Is it Pennsylvania? Is it Michigan? Where are you focused? Look, I, I think you really hit a, a couple of really important states there. But, you know, we kind of think in groupings, Arizona, Nevada, uh, Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan. And then we've got a few outliers where we want to go play offense, places like uh, Minnesota and Virginia uh, that we would like to move into play. But, uh, you know, the key is those seven to ten states are going to be where we have to go play because uh, we won them, uh, most of them in uh, 2016 and put Donald Trump in the White House. We lost most of them in uh, 2020. Uh, we've got to go back. We're playing offense across the board right now in every one of those states. Who did we lose in those states and why? And how do we get them back? I, I, I asked the question because when you focus on election night, which obviously you're an expert on, it's wild how small the margins actually are in a state like Georgia, Michigan. It's not 200,000 votes that, that cost you this state or cost you that state. You only lose a few. Why we lose a few? How are we getting them back? You know, a, a lot of those are just the, the independents, right? So you've got to do two things when it comes to get out. First, you've got to get your people to the polls. And we know uh, Republican voters, we know the, the conservative independents, uh, and it's a matter of get out the vote for those guys. We've just got to drive them to the polls. But then you've got the folks in the middle, and it's about having a conversation. It's about persuasion. Uh, it's about reaching communities that have not always been for Republicans. We are seeing blacks, Hispanics, and, and Asian Americans right now that are coming to the Republican fold because they are tired of being taken advantage by the Democrats and the Democrat policies are not helping their families, which is driving those voters to us. So we need to make sure that we are working all day, every day across the country. It's not just in the battlegrounds, but to talk to the voters, talk to their families and make sure they understand, were you better off under Donald Trump? Are you better off under Joe Biden? That's an easy answer for every American family right now. 
Democrats were about 10 miles ahead of us when it comes to things like chasing down ballots, ballot harvesting, bro, that's legal in 2020. Everybody knows that they've been ahead. Are we catching up? I don't expect us to be right where they were, but are we catching up? Are we even focused on this? We are absolutely focused on it. What we want to do when it comes to the get out the vote operations is we recognize that there are about 50% of the voters are going to vote before election day. Uh, they're going to vote absentee by mail. They're going to vote in person early. And then we'll have about 50% that are going to vote on election day. We need to be reaching all of them. We've got to have our conversations with those voters before they go vote. We can't wait until the last weekend before election day. Half the people have already voted. So we're reaching out to voters earlier. We are directing our, our grassroots activities, knocking on doors, and uh, making phone calls to have those conversations. Our mail programs, our, our digital programs, our email programs are all focused on making sure that we're earlier in the cycle for it. Where you're allowed to uh, ballot harvest because it's legal, we are going to ballot harvest and we're building those programs up as we speak. You know, and, and where we've got states that are universal mail-in ballots, we're gonna be running programs designed to get our folks there uh, via those programs. You know, look, ultimately, you know, we don't care how a voter votes. We care that they vote and that they vote Republican. So we're going to be reaching out to those voters and saying, here's how you can vote in Pennsylvania. Here's how you can vote in Michigan. Here's how you can vote in North Carolina and allow them to understand these are the options and then make a plan. And then we're going to talk to them un as, until they vote because we want them to follow the plan. Michael, money matters. And, and obviously people don't love to talk about money in politics. It feels dirty and wrong, but money is the engine that makes the train go. And Democrats traditionally have had tons of it. How are we doing fundraising? We are doing fantastic. You know, we, we just had an event uh, where President Trump uh, kicked off uh, our Trump 47 committee, which is the joint finance committee between the RNC and the president now that he's our nominee, uh, with a $51 million dinner. Uh, we have, over the course of the first four weeks of him being our nominee, raised over $100 million. Uh, the Democrats have had uh, the president in the White House for over four years. Yes, they've got a big cash on hand advantage uh, before the president uh, won the nomination. But now that he's our nominee, we are moving very aggressively to make sure that we close that gap. One of the neat things that we've seen is the small dollar donors, the, the email response, the digital response, the, the folks that are going online and donating $5, $10, $25. That has absolutely skyrocketed since Donald Trump became our nominee. And that's going to carry us through. We have zero doubt that we are going to have the resources that we need to get our message out to every American family and every American voter. And when we have informed voters, we know that we're going to be in a position to win. Michael, as we've seen time and time again when it comes to elections and things like election integrity, trying to litigate things after the fact may make you feel good, but it doesn't change anything. How proactive are we going to be keeping an eye on things, if you will, especially in swing states, especially in these dirty commie hellholes like Madison, Wisconsin, that can make a big difference? Yeah, this is our single biggest focus, election integrity. You know, historically, the RNC has always been about turnout. We've been about get out the vote. We've had our victory programs in the states, and we're obviously going to continue that. But we have brought on board now an entirely new focus on election integrity. We have opened up a permanent election integrity office, which as the general counsel, before I was the chair, I helped set that office up and started to, to run these programs out. We have two things that we wanna focus on when it comes to election integrity. Number one, like you said, you gotta know the rules of the road. You have to have to make sure that we have the right laws, rules and regulations in place to ensure that our, our elections are gonna be fair, accurate, secure, and timely, right? We wanna make sure that, that we've got the, the, the time results on those that are coming in, as well as transparency uh, is a very big thing for us. So we're gonna work 
with the state legislators. We're going to work with the governors. We're going to work with secretaries of state and boards of elections to make sure that the rules of the road are going to promote uh, a, a fair election. But when the when the when those groups won't work with us, we are going to be filing lawsuits. In fact, we actually have 82 lawsuits ongoing right now in 24 different states around the country where we are suing to make sure that we have things like voter ID, make sure that the states are cleaning up the voter rolls, make sure that when they have mail-in ballots or absentee ballots, that you're gonna have them in by election day, that you're gonna have a signature requirement, that you're gonna have witness requirements on those. You know, these are all things that the American people overwhelmingly support. We've seen it in poll after poll after poll that the voters of, of the United States want secure elections. And so we're working to make sure that that's the case. The second big thing that we're doing is you gotta be in the room. We wanna make sure that we have observers and attorneys in every single room where votes are being cast and votes are being counted. So we are building up right now in all of our battleground states and frankly, every state, uh, we are building out election integrity programs to make sure that we are recruiting and training hundreds of thousands of volunteers and thousands of lawyers all across the country so that we can be in the room. Michael, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. No, right. we really... Sean Spicer, he's always got opinions on some things. Let's talk to him. Go to Sean Spicer, next. But when these polls like the Wall Street Journal one land in the White House and he's losing in all the battleground states. That... No, he's not losing in all the battleground all but one. states. He's coming up and he's um, even or doing better. So, mm. you know what? Once people start to focus in and they see their two choices, mm -hmm. it's obvious that Joe will win this election. Right. He's coming up or, or even doing better. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but that didn't sound very confident. Joining me now... The man who always gives us the inside baseball stuff on this stuff, Sean Spicer, host of the Sean Spicer Show. Okay, Sean, the polls. Everyone loves polls, right? They love the ones that make their guy look good and they hate ones that make their guy look bad. You actually look at all of them. How do the polls actually look, Sean, and why? Well, the polls look great if you're Donald Trump. As you know, we run uh, elections that are based on how many states portion their electoral votes and you need 270 to win uh in those state polls donald trump as the host remember this was cbs this is not exactly going on uh the first or some conservative leaning thing this is a friendly territory that joe biden was at they were basically saying hey here's all the battleground polls that show donald trump ahead and she was like well depends on no 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 all of them they all show them ahead now that being said you can make a million excuses. I've been in the game 30 years. I get it. But to, to, to deny reality, which is that at this point, poll to poll, state part, I mean, when you look at the seven to eight battleground states that will make a difference, which is about 97 electoral votes, Donald Trump is ahead in every single one of them. Now, you can argue that it's early. You can argue that maybe he won't. You can argue a lot of things, but you cannot, as Joe Biden said, argue that he's not ahead. I mean, those are facts. Okay, hey. why is Joe Biden behind, Sean? The, 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 so many of us who pay attention aren't surprised by anything Joe Biden's doing. He's exactly the guy we thought he was going to be if that disaster got elected. So we got elected and did everything a Democrat does and now voters are unhappy. Explain it to someone like me who's frustrated with voters who made this choice the last time. So remember the other day when we had an eclipse and they told you that you needed glasses to look up? Yes, yes. Well, I hope you saved them because that's the, the answer to your question. When you look at the Biden administration, you need eclipse glasses. You cannot look at it and go. It, it freaks your eyes out. It freaks your brain out. You've got illegal immigration. The economy still got problems everywhere. And when you look overseas is a disaster. We're not energy independent anymore. 
Uh, interest rates are still way too high to put home ownership out of the reach of so many Americans. Gas prices are on the reach. I mean, you literally need eclipse glasses to look at the Biden record. And that's why, because here's the thing. And I watched some media pundits over last weekend ask the same question. And the reality was is that Biden presented himself to the American people, granted from his basement in Delaware last cycle, saying, listen, everything that's happened with Donald Trump, I can bring the country together. I can right all of these wrongs. I can do all these great things. And he promised fairy dust. And the reality is, is that now Americans and voters throughout the country can look and say, here's four years of Donald Trump and here's four years of Joe Biden. Which do I like better? As was coined decades ago, are you better off four years ago? And the answer unequivocally in every single instance in case is no, you are not better off under Joe Biden. And so that's the simple answer. I mean, the simple answer is that it is not a hypothesis. It is not an experiment. It is not uh, a nebulous question about whose policies will help you more. You can literally compare apples to apples and say, who did a better job protecting the country, growing the economy, adding to your family and your community's prosperity, keeping the country safe both domestically and abroad? Full stop on every issue, Trump wins. Eric, let's talk about a couple swing states, Sean. I know there are other things we have to get to, nitty gritty things like Arizona, Georgia, actually, both of them combined. Why are there two Democrat senators in these, quote, swing states that we anticipate winning? If I'm on the outside looking in and I'm trying to be King Cynic, we think we're going to take Arizona. The poll numbers look good. We think we're going to take Georgia. But Senator Raphael Warnock would take issue with that. What happened with these states? Well, each is a little unique. In the case of Georgia, I mean, you, you know, Warnock in particular, I think we did ourselves a disservice after the last election. We should have made it clear uh, how important it was for people to get out and vote. We scared them into thinking that their vote wasn't going to count. And the Democrats took advantage of that. That's number one. No, no, And just so we're clear, were there problems with how Georgia handled their election? Yes. And I'm not trying. But at the end of the day, we ceded the ground to them and they won. And we would not have the Biden nominees that we had had Warnock lost like if, if we had Leffler and Purdue still in, we wouldn't have the problems that we have now. The nominees wouldn't have gotten through. We ceded a lot of ground to them. We didn't stay focused on Georgia as an election. We were still getting the presidential election. And frankly, that was a mistake. And I get and I, I get it. I, there was issues, and I'm not trying to undermine those issues, but I'm just saying that we should have been able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Arizona is a bit of a unique situation as well. I don't think we ran the strongest candidate there. Um, and we paid the price for it. There's something that I, I used to, I coined a phrase back in the 90s uh, where I said mechanics matter, meaning that you still have to get out there and run a good campaign. And there's a lot of people who say, well, Trump, he was at the top of the ticket. He hurt us, he helped us, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, whether you're running for Congress, governor, senator, you still need to be a good candidate, have a good message and have good mechanics. You need to have a good ground game. You need to run a good get out the vote effort. You have to have an early vote effort, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we call AB Chase, meaning that you have to have an absentee ballot chase program for those people who have a history of voting early or by absentee. And in a lot of cases, the campaigns sucked and that's it. And you've got to remember that, you know, when you look at a lot of these close, close elections, you mentioned Arizona and Georgia in the Senate races, but then you look at Michigan and Pennsylvania at the presidential level and you're talking 10,000 issue votes, right? So I'm not a big football guy at the college level because I went to a D3 school. But this, this is, I mean, a, a football stadium in most of these places at Penn State or in a lot of these SEC schools would blow that away. These elections are coming down to less than a football stadium on a good Saturday afternoon. And that's the thing is that if the campaign doesn't have their act together, they're not going to be able to pull off a tight election. And that's frankly the case in both Arizona and Arizona and then presidentially in a lot of these big states as well. All right, but before we go, let's talk real quickly about Wisconsin. This is such yep. a critical swing state. You win Wisconsin. I mean, you really are in the driver's seat to be sitting in the White House. And if you don't, you're in trouble. We have Senator Ron Johnson there. He's one of the furthest right senators in the United States Senate, and they just banned Zuckerbucks there. Should I be thinking highly of Wisconsin right now? Yes. But I'll tell you, this gets, but just you brought up Ron Johnson, and I'm going to tell you exactly the opposite of what I said about Georgia and Arizona. Ron Johnson ran in a, a textbook campaign. 
He raised a ton of money. He had a great team. He executed perfectly. And so at a time when everybody said Ron Johnson was going to be left for dust, he focused on mechanics. He had a great message and he worked his tail off and he and and he reaped the benefits of it. Wisconsin is ripe for the picking for all the aforementioned reasons. Uh, they actually are correcting a lot of the wrongs that happened there voting wise. Um, and so I feel very good about Wisconsin. I think you're right. If we can pick off Wisconsin, keep Georgia, put it back in the column, keep Arizona in the column. In particular, I would keep an eye on Georgia because the evangelical effort that people like Ralph Reed are leading to not only register, but mobilize evangelical voters that have not voted before is tremendous in states like Georgia. Uh, Wisconsin, again, is another state that's ripe to put back in our column. If that happens, Donald Trump's guaranteed another term. How about that? John, thank you, my brother, as always. It was friggin' awesome. All right. We still have more? Not done yet. Hang on. You know, I'm from Ohio, and so being from Ohio, I was born and raised an Ohio State Buckeye fan, and I was born, I was raised to hate Michigan, all things Michigan. All things Michigan are garbage. And so that means this, this pains me what I'm about to say. The road to the presidency probably goes through Michigan, which is a beautiful state, I will admit. Joining me now, Tudor Dixon, host of the Tudor Dixon podcast, Kyle Olson, founder of the Midwesterner. Okay, Kyle, sadly, we need Michigan. Donald Trump won it in 16. He did not win it in 20. Why? I think he won it in 16 because um, there, he was reaching a lot of people who um, were receptive and were agreeing with his economic message. I also think he won in 2016 because uh, Hillary Clinton was so terrible and she <laughs> did not resonate in Michigan or in very many places in the country. And so I think that's why he won in 2016. In 2020, of course, we were coming off the pandemic, um, how he was handling the pandemic. A lot of people were unhappy with that. Joe Biden had a had very little message at all. He was campaigning from the basement and he looked like a viable, reasonable alternative to the Trump years. Now, of course, in 2024, we're seeing how all of that played out, but that's why he won in 2016 and didn't win in 2020. All right, let, let's pause on that before we go to Tudor. You say they didn't like how he handled COVID. I've heard this many, many, many different, many times from many different places, but why? What didn't they like? Did they want him to be more pro-lockdown, less pro-lockdown, push the vaccine harder, don't push it at all? I'm very, what, what didn't people like? Well, I think, I think part of it was the vaccine. And of course, look, at, I mean, I think there's, it, it's very easy to sort of Monday morning quarterback yeah. what happened with the vaccine or with the, with the pandemic. Um, but if you contrasted what happened here in Michigan when with Gretchen Whitmer and the you know, lockdown mandates and all the crazy things that she was doing, it just, and, and she, and he was fighting with her and she, you know, was playing the victim, which she does very well. It just didn't, it, it, it didn't really lay the groundwork for a Trump victory in Michigan. Tudor, speaking of Gretchen Whitmer, obviously you're very familiar with her and familiar with how she campaigns. You ran against her for governor. People look at the results of that governor's race and they say to themselves, man, this looks now like a blue state. Is Michigan just a blue state and we're all lying to ourselves over here, Tudor? No, absolutely not. I think that, I mean, to go back to what Kyle said in 2020, it was interesting circumstances because Donald Trump had just come out of the hospital. He had had COVID. He said, I'm okay. Everybody's going to be okay. She seized on that. And she was like, look, he's not going to take care of your elderly, your loved ones. I'm going to take care of your kids and I'm going to take care of your seniors. Little did we know, of course, after November, after the election, she was actually going to essentially kill off significant numbers of seniors in the state of Michigan. 
and handle the pandemic in the complete wrong way, keep our kids out of school, all of that. But she got a pass on that because of abortion. Because in the state of Michigan, once the Dobbs decision came out, she played the abortion card, and I have to say, she played it very well. And she continues to play it. She's in desperate straits right now because Donald Trump has now come out with his stance on abortion. He said he's not going to sign a federal ban on abortion. And she doesn't know how to handle that because she is very scared that that means she is not delivering the state of Michigan for Joe Biden. And even articles coming out this week are saying if Gretchen Whitmer does not deliver the state of Michigan for Joe Biden, her political career could be Dunsey's. And that would be a great thing. Yes, that would certainly be a great thing. Okay, Kyle. So we all remember Donald Trump's statement he made recently. He's made many statements like that. He's very clearly just kind of wants this issue to go away, which I understand as somebody running for national office. Are we now in a position as, as Republicans where we can't be pro-life anymore? If we are not too pro-life, of course, otherwise the women will leave us. Is that where we're at now? Well, I think if you, if you look at what happened in 2022, as Tudor was, was referencing, um, there was a situation where a lot of the pro-life groups, they have focused on politics, so electing candidates and the courts, fighting the issue in the courts. And they have not, in my judgment, spent a lot of time creating a culture of life in the state of Michigan and other states. And so when the Dobbs decision came down and candidates couldn't just simply hide behind Roe versus Wade, uh, it, it created this situation where there was not this culture of life where, and so when people were faced with the, with this decision about supporting Proposal 3, they voted for the most radical abortion policy in the country and it, it by wide, a very wide margin. And so that's the problem that I think a lot of Republican candidates like Tudor and others and the pro-life movement are now facing is where do we go from here? Because we believe in life. We believe abortion is wrong and is evil. But when you've got the, the, uh, the, the voters in Michigan so overwhelmingly not in, that, in, not in that camp, how do you grapple with that? And so I think candidates like Trump are, are trying to navigate that and he's doing that. It seems like he's doing it relatively well based on how the Democrats are are flailing and and are angry at his uh, at his policy, um, but it's they, they as Tudor said, Gretchen Whitmer can't afford for this issue to go away because what would have happened if they didn't have abortion on the ballot in 2022? Gretchen Whitmer would have had to answer for her record, and she she would talk about anything but her record, and so she was able to get through that election by focusing on abortion distracting everyone with that and not talking about her record. Tudor, how do we promote a culture of life without talking about bans in a way that's going to make any woman uncomfortable? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are ways for sure. I think that people haven't been educated on life in many years because I think Roe always protected candidates and we had life groups that were focused on politics over policy and over family. And so on the politics side of it, I think it's very possible for pol politicians to come in with policies that are supporting families in ways that we never have. I mean, if you look at Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, she pulled all the funding from pregnancy centers in our most vulnerable communities. So those people have no choice. She pulled adoption grants. So those people have no choice. She said anything that's anti-choice, she was going to take funding from, but she's actually then not allowing families to thrive. And so I think we have an opportunity to bring that back. But I think this is something that they've been working for decades to create this idea that life is life doesn't matter that you can look aside from life whereas we have not we've been working on the politics side of it and so all of these life groups i would encourage them to go out there and educate and you can educate in so many ways look at how the democrats do it they do it on social media they do it through Art, alt, art and arts and culture. They do it through commercials, all of these, these different ways. They get into our education system and they do it. And yet we're not doing that. We have a, a secretary of education when we are in charge. And yet that secretary of education has never before said, okay, these are the things that we want to see in schools on reproduction. We want kids to actually learn what's growing inside of them. We can do that too, but we haven't been in that position. And I think this was the first time Republicans really realized well, to be honest, the people on the ground, they haven't been promoting a culture of life, and that needs to happen in a different way.
Kyle, Tudor, my fingers are firmly crossed that we take back your wretched state. Thank you both. I appreciate it. All right. We have final thoughts. Well, I should say I have final thoughts. Next. Remember when Pennsylvania was red? It wasn't that long ago. 2016, we all stayed up laughing as Hillary Clinton lost yet another presidential election, and there was Pennsylvania, big and bright and red. And then it stopped being red. It looks really, really blue. Now, I've spent much of my life in Pennsylvania, having been born right there on the border. What happened? Doesn't seem like a blue place to me. Joining me now, Cliff Maloney, founder of P.A. Chase. Okay, Cliff. Between 2016 and now, how did Pennsylvania turn? Well, it's very simple, Jesse, and your one guy can say this too. It was the Republicans. It was the Republicans' fault during COVID. They had no courage, okay? And so what happened was during COVID, there was all this outcry that we had to radically change the election laws in Pennsylvania, and this wasn't done by the Democrats. And a lot of times people want to give excuses to the Republicans or talk about how we were in the middle of some crisis, I don't give an excuse. It is the fault of the Republican Party and the leaders with no spine and no backbone in Pennsylvania. And so in 2020, we went from having what I would call normal elections to 50 days, 5-0, 50 days of mail-in ballots. And so it's very simple <laughs> if you follow the math. Once the rules changed, you know, Biden started up 1.4 million votes going into election day. And so once all this changed, it has become obviously clear the Democrats have utilized this system. And unfortunately, now the Democrats are in control. We've got to play by those rules. Okay, so 50 days of mail-in balloting. I just, I just, I just I, those words are going to echo in my head all day now. Thanks for that, Cliff. Please tell me that system changed now, though, because of course COVID's gone. So it, that system's gone, isn't it? No, Jesse. As you know, Democrats are very serious people, um, and once they take yes. power, uh, they don't, they don't fall for the trap of being called racist or misogynist or anything like that. They stick to the power because they know at the end of the day. Those that are in power control public policy and get what they want. And so we've got an option to make as Republicans. We can continue to say, well, we're going to fix it in the courts and we're going to fix it through the legislature and we're going to fix it the next election. Well, we're here. It's 2024. And so the choice for Republicans is we can complain and we can whine or we can take action. Here's the map. Republicans get 20 percent of all mail-in ballots, 20 percent. All we have to do is go out and bring that up to 33%. And people say, well, how are you going to do that? The math in Pennsylvania shows that there are 1 million Republican voters who will not vote on election day. Look, I want to be clear. I hate mail-in ballots. Okay? Take that to the bank. I'm not trying to move folks from day of voters to mail-in voters. That doesn't change any of the math. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to target those million GOP conservative voters that are registered that don't typically show up. It's exactly what the Democrats have done since the rule change during COVID. You target those low propensity, disengaged voters, all of a sudden they become 75% more likely to vote if they get a ballot in their mailbox. So I'm not trying to pull folks and say, don't vote on election day. I'm trying to go to the crowd that isn't going to vote, that is aligned with our conservative values, and I want them to request a ballot because it will help us drive up the score to compete with the Democrats. How does one target those people, Cliff? Because obviously you're a guy who knows this stuff, but most people don't. They don't understand how this stuff works. I don't imagine you're sitting out in front of everybody's home with a questionnaire, shoulder tapping them as they try to go to work. So how does one target a disengaged voter? Right. So there's about 4 million uh, Republicans and 4 million Democrats, when you look at the math, that are registered in the state of Pennsylvania. And what you can do is we actually pull the data and the Democrats do this. All right. This is not something new. It's just that Republicans are always four years behind the Democrats when it comes to data and taking action. So out of those 4 million, we can look, OK, all of these 4 million are aligned with the Republicans. 
How many elections have they voted in? And so what we're targeting is we're looking at people that have voted in zero or only one of the last four elections. They're what we would call low propensity. And so there's about a million of those. And so you're knocking on their door, you're sending them a mail-in ballot request form in the mail, you're texting them, you're calling them. And I'm happy to tell you, Jesse, I mean, we've launched a program called the Pennsylvania Chase at pachase.com, and we're doing just this. Right now, we've got volunteers across Pennsylvania knocking on doors, texting, writing postcards, mailing these folks that are on that list of a million low propensity Republicans that we're targeting. And so that's phase one. Phase two is once you've got everybody who's requested the mail-in ballots, well, now you've got to get them to submit them. That's where the PAA chase really comes in. We're hiring 120 full-time ballot chasers, exactly what the Democrats do. We're going to knock on 500,000 doors in the last 50 days of the election. And that's how we're going to drive that mail-in ballot result from 20% to 33% for Republicans. You do that, Pennsylvania becomes competitive again, and we can beat the Democrats and flip PA red. What about your Senate seats? What about your governorship? Why are these things blue? Is it all the same reason? Have they been blue just recently? The, 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 how do we flip that? I'm very interested in state power anymore. Yeah, absolutely. So there are four key objectives in the 2024 cycle. One is we can make the state competitive for Trump, obviously being the presidential race. The second is the U.S. Senate. You know, the U.S. Senate also runs through PA. Dave McCormick, our likely candidate, We've got to make him competitive against Casey. I mean, that's something that, once again, mail-in ballots can create. The third thing is we want to flip the PA House. So right now, Democrats control the PA House, and they do it by holding on to a bunch of districts that are actually red districts. And then the third thing would be to pad the PA Senate. But to answer your question directly, yes, there is one reason why we've had these problems since COVID, mail-in ballots. And so once again, it begs the question, do we adapt? Do we refine our strategy? Do we match the Democrats at their own tactics? Or do we just say we're working on changing the rules and grift and raise money off it? Democrats are very serious people. They're not here to mess around. Door knocking is messy, Jesse. Nobody wants to do it. People quit after 24 hours. You've got voters slamming the door in your face, but Democrats continue to put the teams together because they see the benefit. Republicans have to shift in this direction. But yes, you cannot be competitive if going into election day, you are down 20 to 80 in mail-in ballots. That's why we got blown out in the Senate race, very much blown out in the governor's race. And it's the reason that we haven't really been able to be competitive. But I think all that changes now with the PA chase and our effort to increase mail-in ballot returns for Republicans. What kind of a Democrat machine runs Philly? Everyone knows Philly's the reason that state's gone blue. How, how ugly is it there, Cliff? You know, here's the best part, Jesse, and I don't want to encourage Democrats, um, but they're getting a little lazy, and they can be because the Republican Party has been in shambles, uh, to put it quite frankly, from what we've seen on the ground. Think about it like this. I mean, Democrats hire on average between 100 and 150 ballot chasers every cycle. I'm even talking off here. Right When we're looking at school board races or municipality or judge races, we've seen kind of a drop off because they've gotten a little cocky. They're very confident, as they should be, because we've continued to say, don't vote early, don't vote in the mail, just vote on election day, which to them is music to their ears because we're not matching their strategy. Philadelphia and Allegheny counties, where Pittsburgh and Philadelphia are, are some of the most corrupt Democrat leaders that you'll find in the world. But the best part is we don't have to go into Philadelphia. We don't have to go into Pittsburgh. We, we will if we have to. But what we're looking for, Jesse, is we're looking for the high-density Republican areas. Remember, I've got one million low-propensity Republican voters that are not likely to vote in 2024. Those are the targets. So if I got to go into Lancaster, if I got to go into some of these counties like York County and other places – where the density of Republicans is super high, that's where we're going to knock those 500,000 doors. If Philadelphia or Pittsburgh makes sense, sure. But that's the best part. I don't have to rely on the corrupt Democrats trying to block us. No, the problem is the Republican counties. 
We have enough votes in PA to win. We just have to chase those ballots and drive them to turn out and vote. How about that? That's the blocking and tackling we talk about that wins elections, not the sexy stuff. Blocking and tackling. Cliff, thank you so much, brother. I appreciate it, man. All right. I have some final thoughts on swing states. Next. Hang on. It is wild to think about presidential elections and that they're not really national elections, isn't it? It's always hard for me to get my mind around that. I know it, and still, it's hard. I, I sit here in Texas. Of course, I'm going to vote, I'm going to participate, but I don't matter. There are just six, seven, eight states that actually matter, and those are the only states where you need to pay attention to polling. Those are the states where we need to be the most hardcore activists. If you reside in any of those states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, get involved. These swing states in presidential election years decide everything and the margins are always teeny tiny. We keep talking about it, all right? 